we'll have now the fourth day meditation, which is for the souls in purgatory who've been there the longest. The day of prayer for the soul's longest in purgatory. The rigor of the purifying flames is so great that one moment of their endurance is more pain inflicting than many years of severe penance in this world. What then must not those poor souls have undergone who have spent the longest time in that place of torture? Let us try today to alleviate their sufferings and abridge their exile. We all expect doubtless or think ourselves sure to go to purgatory. If we do not think much of the matter at all, then we may have some vague notion of going straight to heaven as soon as we are judged. But if we seriously reflect upon it, upon our own lives, upon God's holiness, upon what we read in books of devotion and the lives of the saints, I can hardly conceive any one of us expecting to escape purgatory and not rather feeling that it must be almost a stretch of the divine mercy with which, which will even get us there. Now, if we really expect that our road to heaven will be through the punishments of purgatory, for surely its purification is penal, it very much concerns us to know the views of this state that appear to prevail in the church. These views agree that the pains are extremely severe, as well because of the office which God intends them to fulfill as because of the disembodied soul being the subject of them. They agree also with regard to the length of their suffering. This requires to be dwelt upon, as it is hard to convince people of it, and a great deal comes of the conviction, both to ourselves and others. This duration may be understood in two ways, one as of actual length of time, and two as of seeming length from the excess of pain. With regard to the first, if we look into the revelations of Sister Francesca of Pampeluna, we shall find among some hundreds of cases that by far the greater majority suffered 30, 40, or 60 years. Here are some of the examples. A holy bishop, for some negligence in his high office, had been in purgatory 59 years when he appeared to the servant of God. Another bishop, so generous of his revenues that he was named the almsgiver, had been there five years because he had wished for the dignity of being a bishop. A priest, 40 years because through his negligence, some sick persons had died without the sacraments. Another 45 years for inconsiderateness inconsider in his ministerial functions. A gentleman, 59 years for worldliness. Another 64 for a fondness for playing at cards for money another 35 years for worldliness. Without multiplying instances, which it would be easy to do, these disclosures may teach us greater watchfulness over ourselves and more unwearied perseverance in praying for the departed. The old foundations for perpetual masses embody the same sentiment. We are apt to leave off too soon, imagining with a foolish and unenlightened fondness that our friends are freed from purgatory much sooner than they really are. If Sister Francesca beheld the souls of many fervent Carmelites, some of whom had wrought miracles during life still in purgatory 10, 20, 30, 60 years after their death, and yet not near their deliverance, as many told her, what must become of us and ours? Then as to seeming length from the extremity of pain, there are many instances on record in the Chronicles of the Franciscans, the life of St. Francis Jerome, and elsewhere, of souls appearing an hour or two after death and thinking they had been many years in purgatory. Such may be the purgatory of those who are caught up to meet the Lord at the last day. We are also told that what we in the world call very trivial faults are most severely visited in purgatory. St. Peter Damien gives us many instances of this, and others are collected and quoted by Bellarmine. Slight feelings of self-complacency, trifling inattentions in the recital of the Divine Office, and the like occur frequently among them. Sister Francesca mentions the case of a girl of 14 
in purgatory because she was not quite conformed to the will of God in dying so young. And one soul said to her, Ah, men little think in the world how dearly they are going to pay here for faults they hardly note there. She even saw souls that were immensely punished only for having been scrupulous in this life, either, I suppose, because there is mostly self-will and scruples, or because they did not lay them down when obedience commanded. Wrong notions about small faults may thus lead us to neglect the dead, or leave off our prayers too soon, as well as lose a lesson for ourselves. Consider the helplessness of the holy souls. They lie like the paralytic at the pool. It would seem as if even the coming of the angel were not an effectual blessing to them, unless there be some of one of us to help them. Some have even thought they cannot pray. Anyhow, they have no means of making themselves heard by us on whose charity they depend. Some writers have said that our Blessed Lord will not help them without our cooperation, and that our Blessed Lady cannot help them except in indirect ways, because she is no longer able to make satisfaction though I never like to hear of anything our dearest mother cannot do, and I regard such statements with suspicion. Another feature in their helplessness is the forgetfulness of the living or the cruel flattery of relations, who will always have it that those near or dear to them die the death of saints. They would surely have a scruple if they knew of how many masses and prayers they rob the souls by the selfish exaggeration of their goodness. I call it selfish, for it is nothing more than a miserable device to console themselves in their sorrow. The very state of the holy souls is one of the most unbounded helplessness. They cannot do penance. They cannot merit. They cannot satisfy. They cannot gain indulgences. They have no sacraments. They are not under the jurisdiction of God's vicar, overflowing with the plenitude of means of grace and manifold benedictions. They are a portion of the church without either priesthood or altar at their own command. How numerous are the lessons we may learn from these considerations on our own behalf as well as on behalf of the holy souls. For ourselves, what light does all this throw on slovenliness, lukewarmness, and the love of ease? What does it make us think of performing our devotions out of a mere spirit of formality or a trick of habit? What a change should it not work in our lives? What diligence in our examines, confessions, communions, and prayers? It seems as if the grace of all graces for which we should be ever imp importuning our dear Lord would be to hate sin with something of the hatred wherewith he hated it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, is not the purity of God something awful, unspeakable, adorable? He who is himself a simple act has gone on acting multiplying acts since creation. Yet he has incurred no stain. He is ever mingling with a most unutterable condescension with, which, with what is beneath him, yet no stain. He loves his creatures with a love immeasurably more intense than the wildest passions of earth, yet no stain. He is omnipotent, yet it is beyond the limits of his power to receive a stain. He is so pure that the very vision of him causes eternal purity and blessedness. Mary's purity is but a fair, thin shadow of it. Nay, the sacred humanity itself cannot adequately worship the purity of the Most High. And we, even we, are to dwell in his arms forever. We are to dwell amid the everlasting burning of that uncreated purity. Yet let us look at our lives. Let us trace our hearts faithfully through but one day and see of what mixed intentions, human respect, self-love, and pusillanimous temper our actions, nay, even our devotions, are made up. And does not purgatory, he did sevenfold and endured to the day of doom, seem but a gentle novitiate for the vision of the All-Holy. But we not only learn lessons for our own good, but for the good of the holy souls. We see that our charitable attentions toward them must be far more vigorous and persevering than they have been. For that people go to purgatory for very little matters and remain there an unexpectedly long time. Their most touching appeal to us lies in their helplessness. 
and our dear Lord, with his usual loving arrangement, has made the extent of our power to help them more than commensurate with their inability to help themselves. We can make over to them, by way of suffrage, the indulgences we gain, provided the Church has made them applicable to the dead. We can limit and direct upon them the inattention of the adorable sacrifice, sorry, the, in, the intention. We can limit and direct upon them the intention of the adorable sacrifice, that is, of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We can give to them all the satisfactions of our ordinary actions and of our sufferings, and in many other ways we can help the suffering souls. It is related of a religious of St. Dominic that finding himself at the point of death, he earnestly begged a friend who was a priest to have the goodness as soon as he was dead to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass for the repose of his soul. He had scarcely expired when the priest went to the church and celebrated Mass with devotion for this intention. The holy sacrifice being over, he had scarcely taken off the sacred vestments when the deceased religious presented himself to him and rebuked him severely for his hardness of heart in leaving him in the most cruel fire of purgatory for the long space of thirty years. How thirty years? asked the good priest in amazement. Why, it is not yet an hour since you departed this life, so that your corpse is, so to say, still warm. To this the poor soul replied, Learn hence, my friend, how tormenting is the fire of purgatory, when scarcely an hour seems to be thirty years, and learn, too, to have pity on us.